over here. Uh, yes, um, I wanted to know, for families, it seemed that a number of you had the burden of um, having to explain to your loved one their diagnosis. So what can we, as healthcare providers, do to help ease that burden? Anyone? Um, well, I think <clears throat> childhood cancer is a little unique because every parent is different in what they want their child to hear. So oftentimes the conversations with younger children are held out of earshot of the child, and we appreciated that. What we didn't appreciate was when some insensitive professional would come in and say something in front of Alex, you know, like, this is a really bad cancer. Somebody said that Did once. Did it actually happen? Yes. And my eyes just kind of, you know, I think if I was a cat, I probably would have raised my back. And I said, can I talk to you outside, please? And she was three years old at that point. So I think it is a challenge because you don't know what should be said. So that's not particularly helpful, I don't think. But I think the primary caregiver is always the person to pull aside first before you have those conversations because I think even with adults, they don't always want to know, as we've learned. They don't always want to know everything, and some do, but I think the caregiver knows that the best. Anyone else? Just to be realistic Thank about you. it and make sure it's not sugar-coated. I mean, I just, at least for me, you know, obviously there's going to be optimism and you're going to do whatever you can, but let's, you know, I think the reality of what it is is important, and obviously you'll know your you'll know your close one as well as anybody, and how how you would present it to them. You you let let that caregiver present it in the manner of the reality of it. And yeah. I think the option of saying, "Would you like me to talk to this the patient yeah. or you know right. this child or your spouse, or do you want to do it yourself?" is right. very respectful and appreciated. Quick question, please. Um, as an oncology fellow, I try to be as good interpersonally as I can, but one question that I have, anybody, what is something that, as an oncologist, we do that, or say that doesn't hit the right strings, and what is something that we do that you keep with you forever? What do you want your oncologist to do that they didn't do, or, or did do, and, and it was a wonderful thing, Jill? Again, I said earlier, mine was when they asked me if they could help me explain to my children near the end um, because I was exhausted and I had felt like I'd said it all. And that, like I said, that sticks with me now. I thought that was fabulous that he was willing to take the time. It became very, per it, I think it showed the children that the doctor had tried very hard because he, he, he came off as loving Tony, thought of Tony as a friend at that point and we had faith that he had done everything he could. What do you want an oncologist? I mean, would you rather have an oncologist say, oh, I've looked at it, I've thought about it, uh, I've consulted others, this is the course of treatment I recommend? Yes. What do you want an oncologist to say, as some of you suggested, well, here are some courses of treatment, and we could do this, we could do this, or we could do this. I mean, I, 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 mean, I, I love the people that were optimistic, that they were enthusiastic. I mean, I talked to more doctors and just, you know, people that, you know, I know this, this is new, it's a new trial, but we're really excited about the prospects. Of it. And, and listen, you always want people that love what they do and they're excited about that, but at the same time, you know, someone else that can pull you aside and just say, realistically, this is, you know, um, I, I don't like the statistical thing, and I know I hear the thing, it's only a stat, I've heard that before, and you're an individual and you could be different, and I understand that, but also the one thing about, you know, the statistical part of it is there is a, you know, that, that's information, that's, that's, that's long-term information. I know everything's different, there's exceptions to every rule, but the reality of what it is, but you do like people that are optimistic, but also that can also have the ability to, to be real about it too. Mary Beth, you wanted to get on that? Uh, this will be a real nursey answer, but... Um, well, I, you're I, a real nursey. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I would say, you know, instead of going in with a plan about what you're going to say, you know, talk to the family. How, how, how's it going? You know, what's a brief assessment of, you know, where they are right then in the whole course of the communication. I think that would give you lots of information and might influence then how you approach, you know, because different mm -hmm. approaches will work better for different people. Jay, you want to do um, One of the things that we experienced was uh, Randy did most of his treatments outpatient. Um, so he would get um, various rounds of chemo and radiation and then uh, the doctor, the oncologist would say, okay, you need to watch for edema. Um, if his blood pressure continues to escalate, right now it's 200 over 100. Here's a blood pressure cuff. I want you to take his blood pressure once a day, every day at the same time. Call me if it gets a little higher. Um, 
I was not medically you trained. <laughs> uh, he had his nurse train me in five minutes on a blood pressure cuff. Um, Randy was doing continuous 5-FU 24-7. Um, I was trained within uh, a couple of hours how to use the sterilized kit uh, and clean his pick line and push heparin through. And I did that for six months um, to keep his lines clean. Uh, there's a huge amount of technical, medically technical um, uh, things that we are asked to do as caregivers. I'd like to make you aware of that. Um, I had no medical background. Um, I, you know, I, I could barely put Band-Aids on my kids' knees at that time because my stomach was so squeamish. Um, but it, was a, it, was a, it gave my husband a huge comfort to know that he could be at home and I would take care of him. Um, but the stress that it placed on me was, was tremendous. And I don't think that the doctors intentionally meant to do that. Um, and that the current status of a lot of cancer care right now is outpatient. Um, and so you send those caregivers home expecting them to watch out for certain side effects, you know, be aware of, take care of, uh, perform this. Uh, and they're really not medically qualified and they don't have any resources to help them. Anyone else? Okay, last, this is the last question, I'm sorry. Go ahead, sir. Um, I'm going to preface my question with a, a quick statement, and then I have a question for Dr. Silver and a question for you, Sam. Um, you know, as oncology fellows, the process of delivering bad news and talking about prognosis is probably the most delicate and the most challenging for us. And, you, you know, you, you get in a situation where you have to balance uh, making sure that the patient is not traumatized by focusing on individuality, like you said. But at the same time, you want to make sure that the patient is not deluding himself or herself. You know, I think giving numbers is a good idea so that you know, the patient and the family could, could plan just in case they don't end up being in that, you know, 80%, but they end up being in the 20% who don't survive at five years. Okay, so what's the question? The question for you. The, no, question, the question for the panel. <laughs> I, I just want to, the question for you, Sam, is having seen the uh, human side of medicine and the implications of healthcare policy, should uh, we plan on bringing uh, a bunch of policymakers from Washington, D.C. to help refocus the goals of the country and, and the policy that is being formulated as we speak? Well, thank you for allowing me to step into the great <laughs> chasm and call a political dangerous position of taking sides on this question. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> but I will say, I think everyone understands that what uh, Teddy Roosevelt first espoused over 100 years ago from the standpoint of some sort of health care, universal health care, if you will. And now with a bill that a lot of people don't like, the law of the land, at least for the moment, uh, we've got to solve this problem. It will bury us in debt, just as Medicare and Social Security and other entitlements might bury us in debt, if we don't. That's the practical side. And the realistic side is something that Teddy Kennedy uh, used to say, a great advocate for health care, and you may not like a, a lot of the ways he wanted to do it, that's fine. When he'd get up on the Senate floor, and I heard him a couple of times, although I was not then covering the Senate, and he'd start out by saying, do we really care about our fellow Americans? And then he'd go on to espouse something. And I think that's a central question. What do we care? What do we owe people? Well, we can argue about that, whether they can stand on their own two feet or not, or this, that, and the other. Do we really care about all of our citizens? All of them, not just the ones that <laughs> are interesting and not boring and maybe successful in their walks of life. And I think it's a fundamental question when you come down to talk about health care, how to deliver it, how to pay for it, how to ration it. But I'm not going to get into any personal views at this time. We've had too much of a great panel who have, and we're at the end of the time. I want to thank each and every one of you. If I gave each of you a time to just say a final word, we'd be here for another half hour. So I'm not going to do it. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>